bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je suis très, très honorée de vous recevoir ici euh, pour euh, une conférence sur les 30 ans de la Convention relative aux droits de l'enfant, bilan et perspective. Euh, donc, vraiment, une conférence organisée par le laboratoire de recherche interdisciplinaire sur les droits de l'enfant avec plein d'amis euh, et collaborateurs euh, que je vais mentionner. Donc, le Centre de recherche et d'enseignement sur les droits de la personne, la Coalition ca canadienne pour les droits des enfants et notre propre cycle de conférences de la recherche en droit que vous connaissez euh, beaucoup d'entre vous. Et donc, je voulais juste euh, prendre 30 secondes pour remercier le laboratoire interdisciplinaire des droits de l'enfant, euh, représenté ici par Mona Parine, ses cofondatrices. Merci infiniment de créer ces espaces d'échange, de dialogue, toujours dans une perspective collaborative, toujours dans une perspective interdisciplinaire, autour de questions vraiment très importantes comme celle de la mise en œuvre de la Convention, qui est, on le sait, euh, euh, un engagement continu euh, de tous ceux qui s'intéressent à sa réalisation pleine. Donc, un énorme merci pour l'organisation de, 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 de cette conférence et euh, d'avoir invité des personnes passionnantes euh, dont je te laisse le soin de présenter à la salle. Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci Margarida et euh, oui, merci à la section de nous permettre d'organiser euh, cet événement. Um, so, tomorrow, it's actually tomorrow, is the, marks the 30th anniversary <coughs> of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that's what we wanted to do something, to organize something. Usually it's a time to celebrate. Um, mais c'est aussi le moment de faire le point. Euh, où est-ce qu'on en est euh, Quel impact est-ce que la Convention a eu au Canada euh, Au Canada, le 19 novembre, on le connaît comme la, la journée nationale des enfants, National Child Day, mais en fait, c'est une journée internationale des droits de l'enfant à cause de l'adoption de la Convention relative aux droits de l'enfant ce jour-là, en 1989. Donc, on peut se poser la question à savoir... Mais la Convention, est-ce qu'elle a eu un impact Est-ce qu'on la connaît 30 ans après la la, son adoption Est-ce qu'on la connaît au Canada euh, Est-ce qu'elle est qu a mené à une amélioration dans la vie des enfants au Canada Quel est encore son potentiel je, je suis certaine qu'on n'a pas encore... Uh, we, we haven't reached full potential of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So what can be done to reach that potential alors, nous avons ici quatre spécialistes pour discuter de ces questions. Donc, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé les 30 dernières années Est-ce qu'il y a eu des avancées par rapport à l'application de la Convention, la connaissance des droits de l'enfant Et comment la Convention peut être utilisée comme un outil de changement pour améliorer les conditions de vie des enfants, le respect de leurs droits euh, au Canada donc, c'est vraiment un, un moment pour parler du, du bilan et des perspectives de la Convention. Donc, nos quatre panélistes, je vais y aller dans l'ordre. We have uh, first uh, Hala Amrwaid, who is a PhD candidate at the McGill University Faculty of Education. She's a child rights education advocate and a consultant. And she also lectures. And she's received several awards in education including a P. Lance Fellowship for Excellence in Education in the Arts, um, Grad, Grad Excellence Award in Integrated Studies in Education, and uh, FRQSC, Doctoral Research Scholarship, etc. So, and she's um, really engaged in the issue of child rights education and um, teacher education on, on child rights, among others. Ensuite, nous avons Laetitia Angba, euh, c'est important de souligner que c'est une ancienne de la section de droit civil, donc elle a sa licence euh, de droit civil de l'Université d'Ottawa et un baccalauréat en sciences sociales également de l'Université d'Ottawa. Euh, elle a une solide expérience en travail euh, dans le domaine communautaire et social et depuis 2014, elle travaille pour la fondation du docteur Julien à Montréal en tant que chef de projet. Et donc, elle va pouvoir nous parler de ses projets, notamment en éducation des droits de l'enfant pour les enfants et leurs familles. 
Euh, ensuite, nous avons euh, Valérie Steves. Um, Valérie Steves et Elisa Romano, both actually, I have to say, are very active members of the um, Laboratoire de recherche interdisciplinaire sur les droits de l'enfant, um, le, uh, le El Ride. Um, it, so Val is a full professor at the Department of Criminology. Um, she is a principal investigator in a big project called the Equality Project, which is a shirk funded partnership of um, including researchers, educators, civil society, policymakers, community groups, um, exploring young people's experiences of privacy and equality in a networked environment. And she's also the lead researcher of the Young Canadians in a Wired World, Wired World <laughs> research project, um, which explores young people's use of network technology. Et puis euh, Elisa Romano, qui est également donc professeure euh, à l'école de psychologie. She is also here at the University of Ottawa. She is also registered clinical psychologist in Ontario, and uh, she also has big research projects that have been funded by, uh, for those who know these acronyms, uh, SHRC and CIHR. <laughs> um, and her research focuses on adverse experiences within the family that compromise children's well-being, mm -hmm. and the development, implementation, and evaluation of <coughs> interventions that promote a children's well-being. And I have to note also that she has received the U University of Ottawa Excellence in Research Award uh, this year. Mm -hmm. I think so, mm -hmm. yes. So, and um, finally, so um, I will be sharing this panel together with Kathy Vandergrift. Um, Kathy Vandergrift um, is a chair of the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. And the laboratoire and the Coalition Canadian for the Droits of l'Enfant collaborate for plusieurs années and we organize uh, regularly des events ensemble. Um, and, um, Kathy has been active in the area of you know, advocating for children's rights for many years, and she has written many reports um, and strategies for, especially for improving the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, in Canada. And uh, she uh, has a master's degree in public ethics from St. Paul University here in Ottawa. And she's received the Global UNICEF um, Aldo Farina Prize for Children's Rights Advocacy, so she definitely is a child rights advocate. <laughs> Alors, voilà pour les introductions. Uh, donc, je vais passer la parole tout de suite à Cathy, qui va faire une petite introduction par rapport au thème, uh, peut-être introduire aussi la, la Coalition canadienne uh, des droits de l'enfant. Mm -hmm. Et puis ensuite, je vais vous dire comment ça va se passer. Donc, on, on va commencer par des, une question générale aux panélistes, ensuite des questions plus spécifiques à chacun, et euh, vous tous dans l'audience, euh, dans le public, là vous aurez l'occasion de participer également parce que nous avons des, des questions pour tout le monde au sujet de la convention et puis qu'est-ce qu'on peut mieux faire euh, pour améliorer son impact, un impact positif dans la société canadienne. Voilà. Thank you, Mona. It's a real pleasure to work with the laboratoire again. I really appreciate that. And this year is also the 30th anniversary of the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children, and our mandate is to pursue implementation <coughs> of the convention. It's also the, the case that the 30th anniversary coincides with the review that's going on of how Canada implements the convention. So it's an opportunity for us. And so that kind of shaped the way we put the questions to ask what have we learned, what could we do better, all of which will hopefully inform a process that's going on in Canada to review how we implement the convention. Uh, maybe at the end I'll tell you a little bit more how you can become part of that process, but I'm sure you want to hear from our speakers. So I'm going to start off with the general question we asked each one of them to answer. And It's to look back uh, at, at the, his 30 years. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child has been in play in Canada for 30 years. Canada was an early adopter. 
What do you think has been one of the benefits or the differences that it has made for children in Canada that we have had 30 years of the convention? And we'll just let each of you answer and then we'll start <coughs> with specific questions. Hala. Okay, so I really had to dig deep for this one. <laughs> so I'll start by just saying that rights really just simply empower their holders. So from my experience, from the children that I've helped learn about their rights internationally, not just in Canada as well, they feel empowered not just in spirit but also in action, and they become more active in their respective communities, in their families, at school, and with their own lives. So it's not only changing the way they are seen by others, but also changing the way they see themselves. So although we're not where we should be 30 years after the CRC, there have been some strides in Canada, so I'll address those. One of them is a change in perception. If anyone knows, children in the past were perceived and treated as objects for a very long time. But that changed, and now they've moved on to independent beings. So now they're perceived as beings, human beings, with rights that can be independent, that have agency, that can think. Another point is in education, and I'll focus on that, there have been some changes. One of them is the banning of corporal punishment in schools, in all schools. It was not too long ago. It was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 2004. That was the date that you know, schools stopped corporal punishment, so that's a good step. Um, there's also some educational reforms in terms of schools, and there have been changes to policies and curriculum across provinces and territories. So some that include the history curriculum that has had amendments, they're not perfect, but they're in the right step. There's also B.Ed. programs, a Bachelor of Education programs and training certificates that have changed. So many universities are reassessing what courses they give their teachers. So now some universities are including social justice courses, uh, equity and education courses, just to ensure that students understand the diverse classrooms that they are in. And the final point, and that kind of also relates to education, but also to law, the Canadian Bar Association has developed their own toolkit. When they didn't find a roadmap that was accurate that they could use, they developed their own toolkit on children's rights. So to help lawyers, administrators maneuver the system and apply child rights in their practice. So I think that's basically it. Thank you. Letitia. Um, ben, je vais commencer par dire que je suis quand même assez euh, émue d'être euh, de retour à l'Université d'Ottawa. J'ai quand même étudié ici pendant quatre ans et donc euh, d'être assise ici à la table de conférencier, c'est vraiment euh, tout un honneur. Et euh, pour, euh, pour répondre à la question que, que Cathy nous pose, effectivement, la Convention, dans notre pratique, on se rend compte que les enfants ne la connaissent pas et ne connaissent encore moins les, les principes de droit qui sont énoncés. Et, Pour nous, la, la Convention relative aux droits des enfants est quand même un outil d'innovation qui est puissant. Parce que d'une part, il permet de reconnaître l'enfant comme étant un sujet de droit et non comme étant un objet de droit. Donc là, il y a déjà à ce niveau-là un changement au niveau de la perception. Mais également dans la pratique de pédiatrie sociale en communauté, pour être en mesure de lire l'ensemble des droits des enfants, parce que c'est ça l'opportunité de la Convention, de vraiment prendre l'ensemble des droits des enfants, puis pas seulement d'écarter un droit qui est plus important qu'un autre. Nous, ça nous permet de faire une lecture pour savoir comment on peut on peut s'assurer de travailler vers l'équité quant au développement global de l'enfant. Et pour ce faire, Hélène Sioui-Trudel, qui est médiatrice, avocate et aussi directrice en droit intégré à la Fondation, a résumé la Convention relative aux droits des enfants en sept grands principes. Et c'est ces sept grands principes-là qu'on s'assure d'utiliser quand on travaille avec les enfants. Donc, les médecins les utilisent, les avocats, euh, les travailleurs sociaux. Donc, on s'assure qu'au fond, qu'importe le professionnel, on est en mesure d'avoir les mêmes outils, le même langage et le réflexe enfant dans nos interventions. Et ça, c'est vraiment très important. Et la Convention sert également de guide, parce que quand il est question de, de faire participer les enfants, de s'assurer qu'ils sont vraiment au cœur des décisions qui les concernent, on s'assure qu'ils qu ont les outils aussi et le même langage que nous pour prendre part justement à, à ces décisions-là, ainsi que les personnes significatives dans leur vie et leurs parents. Et donc, 30 ans plus tard, euh, bien que la Convention est un, est un outil assez puissant, on doit quand même, quand même continuer d'être outillé pour pouvoir la mettre en œuvre, mais surtout, on doit s'assurer de pouvoir impliquer les enfants pour qu'ils restent des parties prenantes au cœur des décisions qui les concernent. 
Thank you. Valerie, one big difference the convention has made. I've done um, privacy advocacy for about 30 years, and when I look back on my career, um, and I think it kind of resonates with some of the things I've heard already. Sometimes I think of the quote from Lord of the Rings when Galadriel says, together throughout the ages we have fought the long defeat. Uh, and, and sometimes you feel like you're hitting your head against yeah. the wall over and over again. And um, I would say that the CRC has actually been particularly important in regard to children's privacy. Um, precisely because uh, it, it goes further than other human rights um, instruments. Uh, so typically uh, in regard to media, and, and we've been able to kind of use that as a footfall, a foothold to, to begin to talk about children's rights in a networked environment. Um, so in other instruments, uh, media is really only connected to freedom of speech. You have the right to freedom of, or access to information. Uh, seek out and share information ideas through any media. But the CRC went beyond that, and in, incorporated a number of media rights that say that um, it expressly recognizes, and I'm quoting the important function performed by the mass media in children's lives. States are accordingly required to proactively make sure children have access to information from a range of international and national sources, especially information, and again I'm quoting, aimed at the promotion of, child, of the child's social, spiritual, and moral well-being and physical and mental health. So over the past, um, well, if, if you think back to 1989, when we were talking about media, we were really talking about television and film and books and those kinds of traditional media. But as early as 1996, the UN started to mobilize these provisions to think more critically about children's needs in a network society. And um, privacy has been one area where I think that's made a significant difference. Uh, about, uh, about 12 years ago, privacy commissioners who had repeatedly ignored any, any suggestion that children had privacy rights that were different from adult rights or protected under um, domestic legislation, started to take this much more seriously because we could link our advocacy to notions of human, uh, human rights that were enshrined in um, the CRC. So rather than just talking about children as objects who become commodified through the new economy, which is pulling data out of all of these network communications, we were able to inject arguments that said kids have dignity. Kids have, the kids are rights holders. They, they're entitled to human dignity. They're entitled to their own culture and to explore their own culture through these different media. And um, um, it, it's made a difference. Uh, so the, the quote that came to my mind was in May of 2019 of the Canadian House of Commons Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy, and Ethics hosted the second international grand committee on bi uh, big data, privacy, and democracy. Um, and at the end of that meeting, there was a discussion of, of all things, children's rights. Um, the chair, the Canadian chair of the committee, Bob Zimmer, had this to say. Um, we need to protect children from surveillance capitalism because the business model of major high-tech companies, the whole drive, is to keep them glued to that phone despite the bad health it brings to those children, our kids. It's all for a buck. We're responsible to do something about that. We care about our kids. We don't want to see them turned into voodoo dolls to be controlled by the almighty dollar and capitalism. <laughs> Up until five years ago, you wouldn't have heard a Canadian parliamentarian question the commercial imperatives behind network communications. And one of the reasons why we're seeing movement here is because we're able to use the CRC to evaluate the impact that these technologies have on our children as rights holders who are entitled to enjoy culture and to participate in decisions about their lives. And I think that has made a significant difference. Thank you, that's encouraging already. <laughs> Feeling better already. Um, uh, Eliza, the, what, what one big difference do you think yeah. the convention has made? If I just think about the field of psychology, which is the area I work in, I would say that we're still in the early stages of understanding the CRC. And I would say that a big difference that the CRC can make and is starting to make is to really make it explicit um, that we have an obligation, both individually and collectively as Canadians, to uphold and advocate for the rights of children and youth. And so my sense is we're still at that stage of knowing that we have this obligation, and then through the articles, the CRC has also provided us with a solid foundation 
on which we can advocate for children's rights. And by we, I mean not only us as adults, but specifically children and youth, having the right to voice their opinions and their concerns. So that's my sense of where we're at, at least in the field of psychology. Thank you. Should we go on, Mona, to the specific questions first? Or does anybody have a burning question you want to ask now? Or will it work better to hear from everyone and you keep um, note of your questions and we'll raise them later? Does that work for people? All right. We also thought we would ask uh, our panelists a question that probes at some of the challenges we're facing in Canada in implementing the convention and ask them in the areas that they work in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a question for Hala. It's been 30 years of work in Canada to promote children's rights, and yet every poll tells us that children and adults in Canada don't know very much about children's rights. So my question is, what step do you think we could take to address the challenges we have in awareness and knowledge of children's rights in Canada? So one of the things that it's, that's very important to me, and I think that's, it's the major gap, is education. And education creates awareness. Education creates a lot of, opens a lot of paths. So the first thing I think, these, this is my wish list. So one, it would be child rights education has to be mandatory in all schools across provinces and territories. It cannot be something that's added. It cannot be something that's just in addition to a lesson, you have rights, go see the CRC or a poster in a classroom. And this is most of the time. If the poster is hanging in the school, that means children know their rights. It's not true. So the child rights education also needs to be a mandatory part of all B.Ed. programs and teacher training and certification. So not only do we have these classes for kids in schools, elementary and secondary schools, but also it has to be in the teacher training. Teachers even now with citizenship education courses are not trained for citizenship education. So they go into the classrooms just reading what is there. Um, there also has to be material that's set, although there's so much material on teaching child rights education online from UNICEF, from different organizations, there isn't one curriculum, there isn't one curricula, there isn't one place that teachers can go to and really understand child rights. So there has to be a curriculum that's relevant, accessible, equitable, fun, and employs critical thinking. Again, and I mean relevant, we have to keep in mind the convention. I, I'm someone who values the convention, but also criticizes it. The convention is from 1989. We're 2019. So it has to be relevant. So even education into the present has to be relevant and relatable. So um, school policies need to be amended and rewritten with a child rights-based approach. Currently, school systems operate on traditional means and traditional rules. They, don't, they haven't changed them. So they need to be amended with child rights approach. Child rights training must be given to all employees and admin. Education must be provided in a way that respects the dignity of the child, enables them to express their views freely in accordance with Article 12, and to ensure the promotion of nonviolence. We currently have a major problem in schools and outside of schools with online bullying, discrimination, sexual harassment and abuse. So a lot of these things are happening in our schools and they're not recorded properly. And this is across provinces and across Canada. So they're not recorded properly. So this has to, there has to be a system where all of these are properly recorded. There have to be transparent measures, guidelines, procedures, policies, and reporting mechanisms that are not presently in place, and I can say in the majority of schools, both public and private. So I think, in a nutshell, this is what needs to be done. And awareness from people as well. People can, as this is my wish list, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think people can read about child rights, transfer this knowledge to others, and transfer it to their own kids and their own relatives. I think this is how it starts. So a lot of the children that I worked with said that 
you know, individually we did small workshops, they said that they're going to take this knowledge and share it with other children so that they can also feel empowered, so that they know that they have rights. So. Thank you. C'est mon, mon tour et je vais, je vais poser, enfin c'est sur la même lancée, c'est vraiment à propos de, euh, de l'éducation aux droits de l'enfant, de la connaissance des droits de l'enfant. Euh, donc Laetitia, dans, dans votre travail, qu'est-ce que vous avez appris au sujet des, des bénéfices euh, qu'apporte l'éducation aux droits de l'enfant pour les enfants et les parents, premièrement et Deuxièmement, comment vous pensez qu'on pourrait surmonter les obstacles à l'éducation aux droits de l'enfant Parce qu'il y en a, il y a des obstacles par rapport aux attitudes, les préjugés euh, envers les enfants, déjà. Est-ce que c'est utile pour les enfants de connaître leurs droits euh, Aussi des préjugés par rapport aux droits, le langage des droits. Il y a plusieurs personnes qui pensent que ce n'est pas nécessaire et ça peut être contre-productif même de parler de droit, qu'il y a d'autres mécanismes qu'on pourrait utiliser. Donc, mm -hmm. voilà. C'est une excellente question et euh, ma réponse risque d'être un peu longue parce que pour pouvoir y répondre, je dois être en mesure de vous parler un peu du projet qu'on a développé à la Fondation Dr Julien qui s'appelle le projet Famille Enfants Réseau, le projet FER. Donc, c'est un projet qui a été mis sur pied par Maître Hélène Siwi Trudel avec vraiment la vision que les enfants devraient participer en tant que citoyens à part entière aujourd'hui et pas d'être des êtres en devenir. Un peu ce que Allah disait, « Human beings and not uh, human beings and not human in becoming », un peu dans cette version de de cette vision de Janusz Korczak. Donc, pour ce faire, il faut que, oui, les enfants soient éduqués et outillés par rapport à leurs droits, mais ça prend aussi des adultes bienveillants qui comprennent c'est quoi les droits des enfants et qui sont aussi en mesure de faire partie de ce qu'on appelle le cercle protecteur autour des enfants. Donc, moi, en tant que juriste et chef de projet, j'ai vraiment l'immense privilège de travailler avec 11 quartiers de Montréal, de pouvoir déployer cette formation-là. On a réussi à former plus de 1400 personnes et ce chiffre est appelé à double en mars 2020. Donc, c'est sûr et certain que euh, la stratégie est vraiment simple. C'est-à-dire, si on part à partir de, des sept principes qui ont résumé la, la Convention relative aux droits des enfants, on vraiment, dans le projet pilote, on travaille pour la tranche d'âge des 9-13 ans parce qu'on se rend compte que le curriculum, il n'y en a pas assez pour cette tranche d'âge-là. Et on forme aussi les parents et on forme aussi euh, les personnes significatives, le, les réseaux. Donc, ça peut être des professionnels, ça peut être des éducateurs, ça peut être des intervenants communautaires, ça peut être la police, etc. Puis l'idée derrière ça, c'est que euh, le, le projet aussi évalué par Franco Carneval de l'Université McGill et Béatrice Godard de l'Université de Montréal. Puis il y a trois points qu'ils ont relevés en termes d'impact auprès des enfants. Donc au niveau de, de la voix de l'enfant, au niveau du confort, puis au niveau aussi du sense of belonging, de la camaraderie. Puis on se rend compte que les enfants se sentent à l'aise, profondément à l'aise, afin de partager leur expérience personnelle. Puis ils sentent que, au fond, ça travaille leur estime d'eux-mêmes. Puis c'est aussi en mesure souvent de parler au niveau de, des expériences qu'ils ont vécues, puis de, 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 de nous situer par rapport à des, des histoires personnelles et nous faire des dévoilements. Donc, c'est à ce moment-là qu'on se rend compte que, bon, les enfants, en ayant le bon vocabulaire, ils sont en mesure de nous dire, moi, j'ai vécu ça à la maison, euh, j'ai tel ou tel droit qui n'a pas été respecté. Puis ça, c'est vraiment profond, c'est vraiment porteur parce qu'on est en mesure de mettre par la suite des actions pour changer la situation que l'enfant vit. Moi, j'ai deux situations où je peux vous raconter l'histoire de Melinda, juste pour prendre un, un nom en exemple. Mais Melinda euh, a été exclue de l'école parce qu'il disait qu'elle avait la varicelle. OK. Donc là, euh, elle sentait qu'elle était toute anxieuse. Elle avait des examens de fin d'année qui s'en venaient. Elle ne savait pas quoi faire. Elle est allée au centre de pédiatrie sociale pour parler à la médecin qui est, qui est pédiatre. La médecin l'a diagnostiqué et effectivement, elle n'avait pas la varicelle. Elle s'est assise avec l'avocate Malika pour écrire une lettre, puis ensemble, qui a été signée par la pédiatre. Puis elle allait le présenter à l'école pour dire « J'ai le droit d'être réhabilitée à l'école parce que je n'ai pas la varicelle. » Donc, mon droit à l'éducation a été bafoué. Et elle a elle-même pu mettre en place des démarches. Au fond, oui, le centre était là pour l'assister, mais elle a eu cette initiative-là d'aller faire ces démarches-là. Donc, c'est vraiment de redonner le pouvoir à l'enfant d'être l'agent de changement même dans sa communauté ou dans sa vie et pour d'autres personnes. J'ai aussi un, un autre exemple, l'exemple de Florence. Florence, elle était dans une école où elle se rendait compte qu'il y avait des mamans qui étaient voilées, qui attendaient les enfants après l'école, puis... 
elle sentait que les autres parents ne jasaient pas vraiment. Puis, elle est allée voir la direction de l'école pour leur demander s'il y avait possibilité de mettre en place un café. Donc, un café en attendant que euh, les parents euh, se jasent, en attendant que les enfants finissent et tout. Pour elle, c'était important de construire des ponts parce qu'elle voyait qu'il y avait, euh, au fond, deux disparités, deux solitudes qui ne se parlaient pas. C'est une enfant de 11 ans qui a pris cette initiative-là, juste parce qu'elle est passée à travers les, 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 euh, les cellules de formation. Puis, sans doute qu'elle avait en elle. Peut-être que sans la formation, elle aurait pris cette initiative-là. Mais ça lui a donné les outils pour avoir confiance en elle, puis poser les gestes pour changer l'environnement dans lequel elle était. Puis, je, pourrais, je vais m'arrêter là au niveau des exemples pour les enfants, puis je pourrais vous en donner plein d'autres qui... En parlant de droits des enfants, on se rend compte qu'au niveau même des adultes, il y a un changement profond. Il y a un papa euh, dans, dans une communauté, il avait, quand il a suivi la formation, il s'est rendu compte qu'il n'avait lui-même pas respecté les droits de son enfant, l'enfant de son fils, puis son fils avait fugué. Après la formation, il a pris le téléphone, il a appelé son fils et il s'est excusé. Puis à partir de là, ils ont été en mesure de retravailler une relation et son fils a décidé de revenir à la maison. Ça, c'est juste pour vous donner un exemple. Donc, oui, au niveau micro et macro, il y a des exemples de changements, mais c'est vraiment plus profond que ça, parce que même les adultes qui suivent la formation, ils se rendent compte qu'eux-mêmes, ils avaient des, des choses qu'ils ont vécues, des injustices qu'ils ont vécues, puis ils n'étaient pas capables de le mettre en mots. Puis en suivant la formation sur les droits des enfants, ils se disent, « Ah, oh, ben, OK, moi, j'ai vécu ça, puis je vais tout faire pour que ça ne se répète pas, autant pour mon enfant que pour les enfants de ma communauté. » Donc, toute cette idée de sac protecteur-là. Puis, dans le cadre de notre travail, pour répondre à, à, la, à la seconde question, c'est sûr qu'on entend énormément euh, de, 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 de préjugés par rapport, euh, beaucoup, beaucoup d'obstacles par rapport à l'apprentissage des droits des enfants. Il y a beaucoup de gens qui disent, on est au Canada, tout va bien, les enfants, ils sont hyper privilégiés, c'est les enfants dans les pays en développement qu'il faut aller aider, parce qu'ici, tout est réglé, les enfants vont bien. On entend d'autres préjugés du genre, mais pourquoi on enseignerait les droits aux enfants il me semble qu'ils ont assez de droits en ce moment. Ça suffit. Hein? On ne veut pas qu'ils soient des revendicateurs, puis on ne veut pas qu'ils soient des enfants rois. C'est vraiment ces genres de pensées-là qu'on entend souvent, mais au fond, moi, je me dis que c'est juste un blocage soit intergénérationnel, soit c'est juste des gens qui ne pensent pas que c'est nécessaire, mais qui ne se rendent pas compte qu'à la fin, ce qu'on essaie de faire, c'est que plus on outille les jeunes, plus ils sont en mesure d'être des citoyens d'aujourd'hui, d'être parti, des parties prenantes d'aujourd'hui, puis de prévenir des actions, de prévenir des injustices, puis d'agir. Puis moi, le fait que je sois informée, je peux tant l'appliquer pour moi que je peux l'appliquer pour mon ami si je vois qu'il y a une situation qui est défavorable à son, à son bon développement, en quelque sorte. Donc, c'est vraiment dans cette mentalité-là qu'on qu est. Puis moi, s'il y a une dernière chose que je pourrais dire qui est importante, c'est qu'il faut qu'on partage le même langage. Il faut qu'on soit en mesure, en tant que praticien, en tant qu'adapté, qu'académicien, en tant que politicien, en tant que professeur de psychologie, en tant que, que gestionnaire, on soit en mesure de partager le même langage, les mêmes bases. Et c'est comme ça qu'on sera vraiment en mesure de mieux communiquer ensemble et de partir vraiment euh, sur une même longueur d'onde, une même lancée en ce qui concerne les droits des enfants. Thank you very much. And Letitia has been part of um, initiatives that we've had throughout the coalition to try and, and talk more about the benefits of children's rights and learning about children's rights rather than seeing it, our, our, our officials tend to see it as a burden. And I think we have been able to shift that discourse a little bit to say that it's a benefit. We're privileged to have the honorable um, sen former Senator Landon Pearson in the room who championed children's rights for many years. And our next question builds on her work. Um, she led a three-year study of children's rights in Canada at about the 15-year mark, and one of the findings of that study was that Canada has not made a shift to the culture of respect for children's rights. So we talk about government's policies, we talk about education, but there's also the culture of children's rights in the country. Val, given the work that you've been doing on girls and the media, what could be done to um, help foster a culture in Canada that respects the Convention and children's rights? Um. I think when, when we do research, and when, when we do research with children, so doing youth participatory action methodologies, um, one thing that really always strikes me is the gap between young people's experiences and what they know about their, their um, ability to access information or to enjoy privacy or to exercise free speech and the concerns that adults have about children's lives. There's often this real gap. And <clears throat> I think part of the cultural problem has been that adults typically default to a peer protective approach. 
you know, that, that, that it's about safety. So if we want to give children's rights um, um, a fair shake, we have to make sure that children are safe in, 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 um, in Canada, which, yeah, I mean, it's a starting point. Uh, but I think the cultural shift really comes when we start to add participatory things to that. Um, young people are, are, are able to articulate their needs and their interests in ways that indicate that we're failing them. So if I, I just look at education, for example, um, I spend a lot of time talking to um, uh, different uh, ministry officials and, and teachers and partnering with them on, on different initiatives around technology. And uh, um, we're constantly sort of facing this, 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 this discourse that kids need to be wired, kids need technology, and that somehow you know, we're gonna be able to create better workers of the future if we can only put these things in place. And yet this technology often works that a child sits in front of a computer screen and an algorithm measures their eye movement and their finger tensility, and then scrapes all information about them off of the internet to find out what the algorithm thinks a child should learn next. And those kinds of, of um, initiatives that are designed to advance the right to education, for example, forget the fact that we're not talking about widgets, but we're talking about people, and don't give those people voice in choices about what happens to them. So, so I, I, I think one of the reasons why we're, we're not making that cultural shift is because when we talk to corporations that are designing these kinds of platforms for children, they automatically switch to safety too and say, well, you don't have to worry, we'll protect that child from stalkers because we, mm -hmm. we have them under surveillance. So, so we, we have that discourse and we fight that when we're in those rooms with adults. I, I've sat with kids for the last year and a half and every time I do a focus group, they go, what is wrong with you guys? Don't you realize pen and paper works better for math? I'm sick of being told I have to use all this stuff. Nobody listens to me. I learn better when I read a book. I really like the library. Not all the time, but for projects it works better for me. And I, I think it's, it's we're, we're, we're so focused on safety, we're forgetting we also have the obligation under the CR to give them an opportunity to participate in decisions about their lives. So we're, we're simply not listening. And, and I find that when we do sit down and try to come up with ways where we connect children to policymakers, amazing things happen. Um, kudos to, to Senator Pearson because you were the first to bring um, a young person in to talk about cyberbullying to senators. Like, wow. It's shocking we didn't think of that before. Thank you so much for doing it. And it significantly shifted um, the discourse. So one of the initiatives that we're working on right now with the Equality Project is we're working towards a youth summit um, in the next year and a half where we're going to bring policymakers into a room with youth activists who are interested in talking about equality and rights. And um, uh, we're going to use deliberative dialogue methodology. There'll be one policymaker at every table and the conversations will be youth led and the, pol and the policymaker's job is to take notes and report back. Um, we're, we're trying to think of ways to make that connection so we can give voice to a very clear articulation on the part of the children that we work with that they are aware that they don't like the environment they're in, they are aware they're not being listened to, and they have some really good ideas about how to um, uh, create an environment which would give them an opportunity to really thrive. Thank you. Um, merci beaucoup. Uh, ensuite, une question pour uh, Elisa à propos de la, la violence et les mauvais traitements envers les enfants. Euh, certains, lorsqu'on regarde les, les différents rapports, euh, il y a encore beaucoup de violence et de mauvais traitements envers les enfants au Canada, euh, malgré les, les valeurs qu'on affirme mm -hmm. euh, à propos euh, euh, de, 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 des soins pour les enfants, la protection des enfants qu'on qu a dans la société mm -hmm. canadienne. Euh, quel type de violence, de mauvais traitement vous préoccupe le plus en ce moment Et deuxièmement, comment est-ce que la connaissance de la Convention euh, pourrait faire ou peut faire partie de la prévention de la violence et des réponses à, à la violence mm -hmm. envers les enfants And do you feel free to answer in English mm -hmm. if you want. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question, Mona. Um, in terms of which type of violence I'm most concerned about, all types, uh, it's really hard to prioritize one. I think that all types of violence against children are a gross violation of their right to safety, their right to protection, 
and the right to develop to their full potential and experience a sense of well-being in their day-to-day -day activities. So there's so many forms of violence against children and youth, and all of them I find quite concerning and that require our immediate attention. Within this context, however, if I had to sort of uh, focus on something, just based some of the, on some of the clinical work that I do uh, with children in child welfare and in my own uh, practice, I think violence within the family is particularly concerning to me. Um, and that's because there's, there's so much violence that does occur in families. And it's typically the kind of violence that occurs very early in life when children are really developing quite rapidly. It's the type of violence that lasts a long period of time and so disrupts many developmental processes, which are really key uh, to mental health and to functioning and to a sense of well-being. And also, family violence typically occurs within the caregiving relationship. Um, so those individuals that are supposed to take care of you are those that are frightening to you uh, and that are not meeting your uh, very typical <laughs> developmental needs. Um, and without that sort of um, relationship, there's all these disruptions in the attachment relationship between the child and the caregiver. And what we know is that that attachment relationship is really the foundation on which all these other developmental processes uh, are built. Things like uh, one's ability to know how one is feeling and how to navigate and effectively respond to one's emotional states are key and they're built on that attachment relationship. And so we often see children that have experienced family violence have huge difficulties around emotion regulation that you can see not only in their relationships with peers, you can see them in the school setting, uh, they're just everywhere. Um, the attachment relationship is also key for um, a child and a youth's sense of identity and also their sense the, of agency, that they are someone in the world that has a voice um, and that when they express their needs and their desires, they're not always met, but they're at least listened to and negotiated. Um, and so I would say that family violence, especially early in one's life within the caregiving relationship, I would find particularly concerning um, in terms of the violation of children's rights. How can we address it um, in terms of using the CRC framework? I guess the way I approach it is we definitely need to teach children and youth about their rights. And that serves a protective function. And I also think we need to take a systemic approach and empower all of those systems in which children are embedded to be able to respect the rights of children and to advocate for children and to really fortify those systems so that they can really do a wonderful job to advocate, to uphold, and to respect children's rights. And so I would say that our efforts have to be sort of multi-pronged um, and include definitely children and youth, especially families as well, schools, um, not only to understand children's rights, but also not, so to talk the talk, but also walk the walk. So how do you implement, how do you interact with children in a way that really puts them at the center of all of your interactions, that gives them a voice, that respects what they have to say, that brings them into conversations, whether it's in the context of a caregiving relationship, a relationship at school, those sorts of things. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we'd like to open uh, this now to the floor. Donc, uh, vous uh, tous vous êtes uh, invités à, à poser des questions aux panélistes um, et uh, aussi faire des commentaires par rapport aux questions que nous avons, uh, nous leur avons posées.
So, so if everybody, I don't know if everybody heard, yeah. it's about the uh, border situations and in the U.S. and uh, and the how how that yes. Do you know anybody on the panel? I can I can say a bit, and maybe some of you want to add to that. Certainly, um, children's rights. We work we focus quite a lot on implementation in Canada. Um, but we are part of an international network as well. And so we work with children's rights colleagues in other countries. And in terms of addressing the situation in the United States, um, work with colleagues who are in the United States who are advocating for it. Uh, and then look at our own role. And I can name two things in Canada, one that um, we have been part of as the coalition and one that I've been part of in another hat I wear. Um, one, as a coalition, Canada deten detains some children. And we worked hard in the last review to draw that issue to the government's attention. It is one where we had some positive response. Uh, Minister Goodell made a commitment to really reduce the number of children who are being held in detention. So it's sort of a question of do right in your own country before we can um, speak to other countries. We still have some children in detention. We're not where we want to be, but there has been progress in Canada on that issue. I guess the other one I would name, and I'm, I'm pulling into the conversation another hat I have, is some of us have challenged the Safe Third Country Agreement to say that uh, we brought a case before the court to say that we do not view that uh, and there's evidence, and some of the evidence that was brought by those groups, that includes the uh, Council of Refugees with whom we have worked in the coalition. It also includes Amnesty International and the Council of Churches. And part of the evidence that was put before the court related to the treatment of children. So we're, we, we are taking it to the court in Canada, basically. Does that? Those are some steps. I don't know if... If you wanted to add anything, yeah, I think for me something more generally is children being separated from their yes. caregivers mm -hmm. in whatever circumstance, whether it's in, in that situation or even in the child welfare context, which is a, a context that I know quite well, is extremely traumatizing. Um, and, then, and then following that, so many other losses that these children and child welfare experience over time from other homes in which they're living, all the school transitions, just compound on that initial loss and that grief that they have. Um, and, it, and it makes it very, very difficult um, in terms of their sense of well-being. Certainly a major um, children's rights issue on the international uh, Arena. Other quick go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Deborah. I'm, I'm interested in how you mentioned about uh, uh, education among the. Yeah, you mentioned you were talking about educating teachers, for example, on children's rights. I'd be really interested to know how many other professions, for example, I think of psychologists, social workers, doctors, etc., um, how many of those professional bodies do or do any require as part of you know, the teaching for professionals to have some knowledge in the convention. You know, I, for example, did a you know, master's in social work. I happened to come across the convention because there was a particular course being taught, but there was no obligation, mm -hmm. as far as I know, for anybody to have any knowledge of it at all. And that seems to me to be pretty cr crucial. So there was that, and I have another a kind of a, another question I'd just like to ask. You were mentioning about um, children being separated from their caregivers. I'd be really interested um, if anybody has any thoughts on um, children being sent uh, to boarding schools, to other countries. Um, I'm, I'm interested in something a little bit related, which I won't go into, but for example, um, and I don't know whether Canadian immigration has any policies on ages, but for example, you know, it's one thing to maybe send a child from India or China to Canada at age 14 or 15 to come to a boarding school in Canada, but would it be okay to send a six-year-old? And I, I'm not sure whether there are any, um, any, any policies on that. 
Anyone who would like so, to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the education. Well, not only I've been struggling to get child rights education into education programs, be it programs, and I'm not the only one. There are other uh, student, graduate students and professors trying to get that into the curriculum in different universities. I've also spoken to professors who teach in medicine and they've said as well, this is something that would be great to have for there, especially pediatricians, young doctors coming up, nursing students, uh, they all want something like this. So it's something that's interesting to them, but they don't have the materials for it and they don't have the people who are gonna teach it. So this is again, because it's not mandatory, because there's no consensus on what child rights are. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's this convention, but do we just bring up the convention and say, you have the right to privacy, you have the right to play? Because at times this is how it's being taught if it's ever brought up, it's taught in this manner. So it's not, there's no real understanding of what these articles are, what they mean, how you can apply them to, you know, within the context that the children are living in and the programs as well. So definitely no, a lot of programs don't require them. I don't know of any that do. Uh, again, there are different universities who do different things and I know, <laughs> and I direct here that the Faculty of Education here is quite different as well and they do other things and their courses are mandatory but that's a whole different, it depends on the university, but no. Okay, so just to clarify though, uh, it may be helpful for anybody thinking of pushing this. You know, one could go to every single university, uh, but one could also go to the, the professional orders, the professional bodies, the College of uh, Physicians, uh, you know, because they uh, typically will state what is required, what type of education, what types of components need to be included in the, you know, education to be able to be a member and so the pressure could come at that higher level, you know, be much more effective, efficient anyway, it seems to me, than going to each university in each program. You're absolutely is, right. Sorry. Is Sue Bennett in the room? Mm -hmm. uh, I saw her earlier. Mm -hmm. Sue, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that you've spent years trying to get children's rights education into the medical um, professions, right, and into training programs. Um, do you have an observation or something to contribute in terms of this question of how do we get professionals in the various um, areas? Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. This is really a, a celebration, wonderful discussion. Well, it was over a decade ago, um, and working with Landon and the International Institute of Child Rights and Development in BC and many other international partners, we were developing something called CredPro, Child's Rights Education in Professional Arenas, and it was covering not just the medical and the health, but the social workers, psychologists. We have still a wonderful base of a curriculum to use in, in multi-sectoral, multi-professional systems. Um, so it's a struggle, it really is, and when we talk about the culture of child rights, it w we're not there. If we have the culture, mm -hmm. this is going to be embedded. We've got, we, ha we do have the tools, but we need the champions. We do have champions, but getting this into the systemic civil society, but bottom up, top down, um, has been a real struggle. So I'm fully agreeing the education of, of kids on the, their rights um, from the bottom up for them to know their rights, for them, the next generation, to take this forward. But if anybody, I'd be interested in a conversation after this by email, whatever. Mona can put us in touch um, if people want to revive this, move it forward. We're uh, celebrating tomorrow. Let's make some progress from this celebration. Thank you. So we, we have been, uh, I guess I would name one other um, structural challenge we have in Canada, and that is that um, we, a lot of these professions are regulated separately in every province. And uh, uh, I think we've struggled with the children's rights and federalism through the 30 years. I think we have turned a bit of a corner to begin to say children's rights are a benefit to federalism 
but it still is a challenge in this country. And it relates to your second question too, because the rules about boarding schools also vary by provinces. Um, so one way of getting at it is through the immigration system, but another one is the policies of each province. And so making children's rights work in a federalist country is a bit of a challenge, but um, we're, we're, we're making progress. Landon, I think. Oh, sorry. One of you wanted to comment more on that? Professional education? Yeah, no. No. I, I, I don't know about the boarding school, so I can't really speak to that issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to pick up on some of the issues that you've already raised. One is this question about the culture, shifting the culture about children as a more global issue, that global that is across populations. You've spoken about the dignity of the child. One of the things that I really want to insert into this kind of conversation is that children are our teachers. It's not the teachers <laughs> that are it's that power imbalance and all the things we've talked about are, are vested powers that have to be shifted so that you begin to look at children as partners and not as, as uh, something that has to be controlled or, uh, you know, one has to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I think if we can, I think there is a shift and I think as children themselves are beginning to find a certain more agency that shift may accelerate, I'd like to think. But really, uh, as we look at our own children, those of us who had the advantage of having children, they were the ones that taught us, not, not we them. One learns so much. And there is something that I think equivalents a bit to the women's movement back in the days, olden days when there was the same sort of issue, is that there's something in the childhood imagination, the child imagination that's different from ours. And we will lose that <coughs> richness when we keep trying to suppress it. <laughs> so it's how do we shift the balances so that we see children as partners, that, we, in, in, that the relationships are significant, and that we are prepared to learn from them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I just wanted to know, je voulais faire remarquer qu'en fait, les, les points qui ressortent de, de la, de, des propos de, de chacun, ça, ça se concentre vraiment autour de ça, de, de la perception de l'enfant, de la convention a réussi à quand même faire changer la perception de l'enfant. Donc, on, tout le monde a parlé de sujet de droit. Tout le monde a dit qu'il ne s'agit plus d'être un objet de droit. Euh, euh, tout le monde a parlé de la voix de l'enfant, agency, euh, la, la, la connaissance des droits. Donc, c'est vraiment ce, ce package-là hein, qui, qui existe, qui est là, qu'on a vu des changements depuis 30 ans. Et pourtant, c'est ça aussi, c'est à ce niveau-là aussi où il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. C'est... Il y a encore des, des obstacles par rapport à, à ça, à reconnaître les enfants comme euh, ayant une, vraiment une valeur égale euh, aux adultes et qui peuvent nous apprendre des choses. Euh, et, euh, et surtout, en, comme le disait Laetitia, en connaissant leurs droits, euh, peuvent encore plus, mieux articuler également. Euh, et je pense que c'est important aussi, c'est l'utilisation de la Convention comme... Euh, comme un outil qui permet d'avoir un langage commun. Et aussi, là, là, on a un panel très inter multidisciplinaire, euh, et c'est comme ça dans la vie, dans la vie des enfants, c'est une vie multidisciplinaire. Euh, et et les, les, les différents professionnels qui travaillent avec les enfants, que ce soit un enseignant, médecin ou autre, on, ils ont tous des langages différents, mais le langage commun vient, peut venir de la convention et, Comment faire en sorte qu'on puisse l'utiliser plus ainsi comme un, un outil qui donne un langage commun aux enfants, aux professionnels euh, et qui donc permette un, un meilleur respect des droits dans tous les différents domaines, que ce soit la euh, question des, des frontières ou, euh, ou soins de santé ou, ou quoi que ce soit 
Other questions, comments, areas you're interested in? And they don't have to be areas that were addressed by the panel. We, you know, mm -hmm. if you have areas of children's rights that you're interested in, and I'm sure we have folks in the room who can uh, help pursue the discussion. Bonjour, merci à toutes. Um, uh, ce qui m'a interpellée au départ, quand Madame Paris vous avez. Uh, can I ask you to just a little louder? I think some folks will have trouble he hearing you. Comme ça? Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Parlez un peu plus fort. Là? Oui. Yeah. Ok. Uh, Alors, merci à toutes, je disais. Et puis, euh, euh, dans l'introduction, Madame Paré, vous m'avez interpellée quand vous avez parlé de, du potentiel de l'acide. Parce que pour moi, ça induit le potentiel des enfants. Euh, ça amène aussi à la réflexion de, euh, de certains adultes qui peuvent être ré, euh, résistants ou réticents à l'idée que des enfants puissent jouir de leurs propres droits, d'être des sujets de droits, et je dirais même actifs, et non seulement des objets de protection. Et, euh, et finalement... Euh, par rapport du coup à cette dernière intervention sur euh, le langage commun que peut, enfin, que peut être l'acide en tant qu'outil, je me demande si ça ne peut pas être aussi euh, un moyen de se poser la question est-ce que l'enfant euh, pourrait être considéré totalement comme citoyen euh, Ce concept de citoyen, essayer de l'envisager comme tel, parce que peut-être c'est ça qui fait qu'il euh, n'a pas euh, la chance euh, d'être entendu comme... Euh, C'est prévu par l'acide, euh, d'être visible aussi, parce qu'encore faut-il que, comme Madame Valérie Stib a en parlé, les médias puissent le mettre en avant, et puis euh, euh, continuer dans ce, ce changement de perspective en fait euh, de l'enfant en tant que tel. Donc, est-ce que c'était une, une question à, à, à quelqu'un ou à un commentaire de manière générale So, this was about the child as citizen. Can we consider the child, can we consider children as citizens? And the fact that we actually don't could be still an, an obstacle to them uh, exercising their rights. Um, I was doing focus groups with uh, teens over the past weekend, and we had a conversation about that actually. And and um, what what was really striking about about this uh, round of research was was um, if you if we were talking about rights. You know, do you have a right to express yourself? Do you have a right to do these things? And they answered it in two ways. They basically said, well, practically no. You know, we have no privacy. Um, everything that we say is going to be used against us. Uh, we're worried that if we say something when we're 14, it means we won't be able to get a job when we're 19 or 35. So we've retreated from the public sphere. And we are disengaging from any kind of active citizenship precisely because the environment around us has been constructed in a way that shuts all that down. And then we talked about, well, what about the shoulds? Oh, no, none of this should happen. We, we, we should be able to have access to non-commodified spaces where we can participate in dialogue with other people. Um, there was a, a real call for spaces where children could talk to each other without adults um, um, interfering or, or trying to steer the conversation in particular ways so kids could articulate the rights that were important to them. So so I, I think this is really a failing on the part of our, our schools and and our, our community organizations that we've created an environment where where children feel like they, they their job is to consume stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like my job is to go on to, to social media and not say anything about me because that's too dangerous, but to make sure I like the right stuff. Uh, and, and they know that this is a, a, a bankrupt form of publicity. And they're looking for these spaces where they can have authentic conversations with each other. Um, we did some groups um, um, last uh, about six months ago with LGBTQ kids. And the trans kids articulated this so beautifully. They said, you know, when you're trans, there's really, there are not a lot of people in your community you can just kind of turn to and go, hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this, what do you think? So we rely on these kinds of network technologies to find community. But it's now getting to the point where that's being shut down for two reasons. One is because we're always under surveillance, so if you do, you're, you're going to be outed before you're ready to be outed. But the other is because of the adults in these spaces. So uh, a one 13-year-old trans boy in Ottawa was saying, you know, I went online, I went into this group, I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm trans, I'd like to meet other 
people who are sharing my lived experience. And he said within five minutes, I was being yelled at by a bunch of adults telling me I didn't have the right definition of trans. And, and, and so I really think it's on us. We're the ones who are, are, are not acting as good citizens. And we are the ones who are not creating places for public debate. Um, and, and places where children can engage as citizens. And I think it's an environmental thing. So, so um, certainly in, in the work that we've been doing in the last year, they're, they're telling us that. You guys have to do a better job. And uh, Kathy, if I can yeah, add something also. Oh, as Valerie mentioned, and Landon as well, there's this power struggle. Mm -hmm. You would not imagine how scary rights are for adults. Mm -hmm. I've heard it in yes. when I was working in alternative care. I've heard it from teachers in schools, from principals, from, from parents who said, you know what, what do you mean teach them about their rights? What will that create in my house? Imagine my child closing the door and saying, I have the right to privacy. But this is not what rights are. This is not because they don't understand their rights. And then when you have a conversation with them about what these rights mean and how empowering these rights are for both sides, they change their perception. But it's the lack of understanding of what rights are. And some adults don't even know their rights. And you'd be surprised. This is also something that happens in Canada. Everyone says, you know, it's for other countries. Some People have not read the charter. Some people don't know their own rights. So I often go into, you know, with adults, I ask them about their own rights. And yeah, we have the right to freedom. What else? What other rights are there? What rights do you have? So I think we have to really teach adults their rights. We have to really teach them what rights mean and how to approach these rights. And one of the things about power relations that I wanted to mention as well, for me, I do it through creative drama. It's to create this other balance. It's to create this, you know, you're not teaching is about power. And unfortunately, you know, the way the classroom is structured in the front and people are listening and, and that's power. That denotes power. So for a lot of kids, the fact that we're standing here teaching them, we've automatically just created that power. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time we teach creative, we use rights you know, to, to, through creative drama to teach rights. And it's a totally different world because they translate the rights the way they see them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, you know, with the right not to be abducted, one of the children mentioned, oh, so if a kidnapper comes to me, I say, stop, I have the right not to be kidnapped. This is his translation of it. So was that and then he, we were started, we laughed, and then we started asking each other, you know, the questions. What does this right mean? What does kidnapping mean? Who, who's usually the kidnapper, you know? And it gets you into a whole different set of conversations. And mm -hmm. it's always the stranger from afar that's big, that's scary, that's going to come and try to take them, and they're going to say, you know? No, but we already know that. So these conversations open up if you have those, you know, if you open the, if you open the CRC and just analyze each one. I think, and you know, adults need to be less afraid because rights are not about, you know, excluding them, and that's what they think it is. It's cr it's mm -hmm. going to create an upheaval. All these demanding little people, right? Je veux juste rajouter que le défi aussi c'est de pouvoir co-construire des espaces avec les enfants, puis d'être en mesure aussi de développer ce réflexe là où on les consulte. Parce que c'est bien beau de dire que tu es un citoyen, mais si tu es un citoyen mais qu'on te donne pas accès à l'information, ton pouvoir de participation déjà là est réduit. Ça va être aussi simple pour vous donner un exemple que les dernières élections qui a eu au Québec, nos enfants sont allés sont venus nous voir, nous ont dit mais ça nous tente nous de connaître c'est quoi la plateforme électorale des personnes qui se présentent dans notre quartier. Donc, ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a composé des questions avec eux qui faisaient du sens pour eux. On est allé à la rencontre de chacun des candidats et ils ont fait une vidéo qu'ils ont diffusée sur Internet. C'était vraiment simple, mais ils savaient qu'il y avait des élections, mais la façon dont on verbalise, la, la façon dont on parle, il n'y a rien qui est accessible au niveau du langage pour les enfants. Je vais vous donner un autre exemple. Les enfants, sont, ils sont à l'école, ils arrivent dans le gymnase, ils se rendent compte qu'ils ont fermé le gymnase parce qu'il est en construction. Mais eux, ils, sont, ils ne savaient pas. C'est sûr que s'il y a une construction sur votre rue qui décide de fermer euh, euh, le, le boulevard, qu'est-ce qui va se passer? Vous allez avoir une affiche sur votre porte qui va dire que le boulevard va être fermé pour les dix prochains jours parce qu'il y a une construction. Mais dans le cas des enfants, on ne prend même pas la peine de les informer parce qu'on vit dans un monde où c'est acquis pour les adultes. Mais pour les enfants, on n'a pas ce même niveau de réflexion-là. Donc, de développer notre réflexe enfant est vraiment important parce que ça nous permet de nous 
ramener à leur niveau et pas s'attendre à ce que l'enfant soit un mini-adulte qui doit un peu tout comprendre ce qu'on fait. Donc, on a vraiment ce défi-là à faire euh, devant nous. Euh, il nous reste environ 10 minutes maximum. Alors, J'aimerais que euh, Cathy nous parle un petit peu euh, du processus d'examen de, de la mise en œuvre de la Convention au Canada. Comme elle le disait, on, en est, en, on est en plein processus euh, d'examen maintenant avec le rapport euh, du Canada envoyé au, au Comité des droits de l'enfant. Et puis, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire, euh, nous, vous, euh, pour euh, contribuer euh, à cet examen? Euh, quelles sont les, les questions vraiment importantes à envoyer au comité des droits de l'enfant euh, pour qu'ils aient un, un meilleur, euh, une meilleure euh, compréhension de la situation des droits de l'enfant au Canada. Thank you. I'm sure we, we have lots um, more to discuss, so hopefully we can pick up some of the specific issues afterward. And I would just say, you know, one of Landon's first reports was called Children, the Silent Citizens, and I think that mm. did start us... Um, Uh, with a conversation and, and just on another piece of that, we are now looking at uh, challenging the age of voting in this country and again that is going to raise the question of how we treat young people as citizens. So that, that discourse is on. In terms of the review, um, we are approaching this review as an opportunity and so we are looking for broad participation in it. Um, Canada filed its report nine months late, which led us into delay, but we now have dates for the review. Um, so we, we are looking, I guess, um, let me start from how can you be part of, of this review? If you are aware of children's rights issues, a certain aspect of the convention that really interests you or you've been doing research in a certain area, we are trying to pull all of these things together as civil society to inform the review of Canada. The government's report is nothing but talking points. It's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I've even had officials acknowledge it's embarrassing. So it is up to us at civil society to really talk about what is the situation in Canada when it comes to children's rights. The broad message in the government's report is that Canada is a leader in children's rights. We respect all children's rights. Everything is fine in Canada except for a few indigenous children and we're dealing with that. I'm being a little harsh, but that's about what it says. So, but we have an opportunity as civil society organizations and individuals to have inputs into this process. And the more voices we raise, the more we can also uh, encourage, prod the government in Canada to take all of this more seriously. So our strategy focuses on in Canada and going to the UN committee. The UN Committee is the one that will officially review Canada. But we know every government can survive two bad days at the UN with no trouble. So we have to also bring it home. We have to bring this process home of looking at how children's rights are not being implemented in this country, what could be done better, put those issues forward through the review process. So just a couple dates in mind. Uh, March 1 is a deadline for what's called alternative reports. That may sound scary, but what, what I want you to think about is if you have an issue or a situation or, that you are concerned about, frame it as much as you can. Contact us. The coalition is helping people frame their issue in terms of the recommendations Canada got last time or the convention. We will provide assistance. And then some may choose to go and make a report to the UN Committee. You have that right. So if you wish to file a report with the UN Committee, we will help you. January 7, we are hosting a webinar on the process so you can understand it. But we're encouraging you to use this process for your own research, advocacy, issues in Canada as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the next steps, let's... I won't spend too much time on them right now, but we will be tracking this process, reporting it back, following up on it, and trying to keep uh, anyone in Canada in interested, uh, informed about it. There is a page on the website rightsofchildren.ca, which is about the review process, and that's where we will be posting. So is there, are there any 
questions. I did that quickly and probably left a lot of gaps. I mostly don't want people to feel intimidated about it and mostly want to see it as an opportunity. It can be an opportunity for you to raise an issue that matters to you and you don't need to take on the whole convention. If, if we'll help put the pieces together, but we do want to bring, um, the more reports we have, the more Canada will pay attention. It's good, boy. Let's yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, at the moment in Quebec, definitely a lot of issues that are raised regarding the child care protection system. Uh, there is a commission that is called the Commission Laurent that is evaluating terrible events that occurred where one kid actually died uh, that was under the care of the government. I see from a practical point of view that absolutely no professional that I work with, and I work for the child protection as a lawyer, would ever think of going through the UN process that you just explained. And how do you ex how do you have an explanation for that? Because yeah. there is like a process that is more provincial, more known, and everybody's talking about it. But in the media, absolutely nobody that I heard in my practice is aware of this review happening and is, to my knowledge, involved. Of course, I don't have like a, an exhaustive knowledge, but I just know about it because I'm also in university. But as a practitioner, like as a lawyer, I wouldn't yep. know about it. We're very concerned about the commission that's going on in Quebec uh, with the youth protection system because it will have ripple effects in other provinces and we have issues elsewhere as well. Um, and uh, the good news is we hosted a gathering in Montreal in <coughs> September to build a bit of a child net rights network in Quebec. And um, the attendees there flagged this as one of the key issues that they're addressing. And we have two people here, um, uh, Hala, I don't want to put you on the spot, Hala and Letitia, who are uh, familiar, and there are groups getting together to also make submissions to this commission based on children's rights. Because one of the glaring first steps that mattered is the commission decided it would not listen to children under 18. Wow. Not listen directly to children under 18. That's pretty important when it comes to the child welfare system. So um, we, we engaged it at that session, and um, Letitia, would you want to say anything more about it? You are participating. Um, right. At the moment, for sure, with the Commission Laurent, one of the challenges that with the review, it's clear that it's something I feel is much more uh, calling for international or uh, practitioners that are like much more into children's rights or research, but in terms of practitioners into the field, one of the things that I've been, I've been realizing when I'm listening to the Commission Laurent is that like a lot of people are starting to bring forward the, the idea and the language of children's rights and the idea of like it's not being respected and how it can be better ingrained. So if you listen to some of the, the, the interviews that are being brought, is people are much more aware that there's a disconnection between what we're saying we should do and what is really happening. And the fact that they're, they're able to interview a lot of people from various uh, disciplines is really helping towards that. But with regards to the review, for me, it's still a little bit of a mystery of how come practitioners and lawyers are not necessarily aware of, of that. And it's a, 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 a work that the CCRC has been doing and we keep on building every year, but it's still something that, that is unknown and should gain in, in terms of like more, uh, I don't know, we should do some like a marketing campaign about that eventually, but. <laughs> And if you're interested, honestly, like we're trying, the network now has several NGOs, community groups, professors from different faculties and different universities as well. So if anyone is interested or knows an NGO or a community group that wants to be a part of the review process, so we can all work together on submitting something about what's happening in Quebec, which we are doing right now. So if you want to add your name to the list, we can add your name and you can send it to other NGOs who want. So we're trying to make the community as big as possible the network so that we can all contribute to this report or write different reports, help each other write different reports about what is happening, what is the status of children's rights in Quebec. So we can definitely add you to the network so that 
this can raise awareness as well. And we need one in Ontario as well, by the way. Um, and we are working on one in, in BC. Um, and if we can get a few provinces to, to do that, we will begin also to tackle this challenge in Canada about federalism, right? Children's rights matter at the provincial level as well as the federal level, and the provinces signed on to the convention, but they're not being held accountable to it. So, whatever we can do. Um, je, vais, je vais devoir uh, conclure, um, malheureusement. Um, et ce que j'entends, en fait, là encore, c'est uh, une question de manque de formation en droit de l'enfant, manque de formation professionnelle en, en droit de l'enfant, et que, et que les, la formation en droit de l'enfant devrait contenir non seulement hein, les droits, j'ai droit à ci et ça, à ça, mais également sur ce mécanisme. Donc, ce mécanisme n'est pas du tout connu au Canada, pas du tout. Même par ceux qui connaissent les droits de l'enfant ne connaissent pas ce mécanisme. So, um, Thank you very much to everybody who's here, and especially our panelists. Please uh, help me thank them. Thank